Yeah, go ahead. Okay, this is January 13th, 1988. Yep. This is Joe Todd and an interview with Mr. Daniel Goodwin in the Osho, Missouri. Right. Sir, where were you born? I, I was born within five miles where I'm at now. Across the Shoal Creek over here. And I, well, I, I always write it down as Diamond, Missouri. Diamond, Missouri. I was closer to Diamond than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And when's your birthday? Well, October... Let's see. What day is my birthday? It's October the... Uh, 20... 26th. 1909. 1909. 1909. Who was your father? George Goodman. George Goodman. Yeah. And your mother? Clara. And what was her maiden name? Lewis. Was her Lewis. L-E-W-I-S. L-E-W-I-S. Were they both from this area? Yeah, they were both from Newton County. Mm-hmm. Newton County. What type of work did your father do? Well, he was farmer and just farmer. Mm -hmm. And you started the school where? Diamond. Diamond? Yeah. I graduated from Diamond High School. What year? Oh, gosh. I forget. I quit a time or two and went back, but... Uh, let's see. I don't remember what year I did graduate. Mm -hmm. I got a diploma, but... Mm -hmm. I was trying to think where did I put that diploma. I just think one of it was easy for me to get to. I'll look and just mail it in. From I won the Navy in 1936, and I graduated two or three years before that. Why'd you join the Navy? Why did I? Yes, sir. They wasn't the thing to do in this part of the country. I say lack of uh, I guess. anything to do. I went. To, uh, Got out of high school, graduated from high school, went to business college. Mm -hmm. You couldn't find a job making, only things that you could get jobs around for a dollar a day, helping the farmer. Yeah. But there was no future. Yeah, just a second. Let me. In, 20, uh, in the 20s. 29, I think. That's what I was going to say, 28 or 29, right in there. Mm -hmm. I quit school time too. So you got out just in time for the Depression. Yeah. Where do you, didn't you go to business college in Joplin? Yeah. What year was that? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. I went up there at business college. And... Mm -hmm. Let me ask, why did you join the Navy as opposed to the Army or the Marines? Well, I don't guess there's any... I never considered the Army, I don't know, but I figured I'd just rather travel on this. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Where did you go for boot camp? 19 and 30, er, 34, October. And where'd you go? San Diego. San Diego. Tell me about boot camp. Oh, what happened there? Well, I was, come right down to it, I was a little older than most guys. Was I, after I got out of high school, I flew around and worked on the railroad and this and that. And uh, in boot camp, I was a little older. Not as foolish, baby, mm -hmm. but uh, I had a good time there. I had a brother in San Diego, and I did have a place to go on the weekend where most of the guys didn't, but we only made uh, enough to go ashore once or twice a uh, month, you know. Let's see, we got about, we didn't get $18 a month, mm -hmm. so I wasn't much to go downtown fool around. And by having a brother, well, I could go a little oftener than most of the guys did because I could stay there all night. It didn't cost me nothing. Now, was your brother in the Navy also? No. Mm -hmm. He just worked there in San Diego. Mm -hmm. He'd been out there for a few years. Um, what type of training did you receive? In what kind of? Yeah. Well, I never got any special training. Mm -hmm. Just boot camp, learned to march, and everything like that. That was about all when I went through there. Mm -hmm. They didn't have no special schools at that time. And how long did boot camp last? Three months. Three months? 
and I went from there. How'd they treat you in boot camp? Was it pretty good or? Well, that's kind of a hard question. If you was a reasonable person and tried to do what you should do, mm -hmm. you didn't have a bit of trouble. I didn't have a bit of trouble. They treated me and I felt like I was one of them, mm -hmm. you know, one of the ship's company and everything. And they taught me to march and everything like that, and drilled you. And, but to me, I was satisfied, and nobody ever bawled me out. I'd done my job, what they wanted me to do. And you thought I'd had a little trouble because I was older than most of them. But I was old enough I wanted to get along. Yeah. Have any trouble with all the calisthenics and no. physical training? I was always a pretty good athlete. Mm -hmm. So after boot camp, where'd you go? I went directly to the, let's see, let me think about it, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Did you request the Oklahoma or just assigned to it? No, I requested the West Virginia. Mm -hmm. and I got to Oklahoma. Any reason or? No, no reason I know of. Just uh, maybe they didn't have any, need anybody on the West Virginia and mm -hmm. they've seen I won the battleship. And maybe that's it. a lot of them put in for a battleship and got a tin can, so I don't know. Why did you request a battleship? Oh, I wanted on a bigger ship, mm -hmm. and I would had a brother on a battleship a few years before that. I suppose that's mm -hmm. why I wanted on one. I don't know. It wasn't no particular reason. So when you first saw the Oklahoma, what did you think? I don't know, it's kind of what I expected because mm -hmm. I'd, you know, seen pictures and stuff. How big is that ship? How big? Yeah. It wasn't a, the biggest ship, but it was about as big as any of the other battleships. Mm -hmm. so. A little smaller, I guess, mm -hmm. maybe a little shorter, but it was the widest one in the fleet. Hmm. Back in them days, that ships come out and then the Well, before I went aboard it, they put a blister edge on the side and a space about that far wider than the ship mm -hmm. and then closed that and went all the way practically to the bottom of the ship. That would give them extra support and everything in case of torpedo. And it's just an air vent, you know, like, but it would help kill the torque. Or maybe exploded before it got to the main part How of the How come it didn't work? What was the reason? Why didn't it? Yeah. Well, I think uh, probably didn't delay. It was too close and it didn't delay torpedoes or something, mm -hmm. you know, I guess. Yeah. Um, where were your quarters in the ship? Quarters? Yeah. Low deck, first deck. First uh, deck. Yeah. Was it four after? Four. I was er, forward. The first division is all the way forward, and the second. I was in the second division. It was just right across from the first division. They took care of the, the right hand. The first division took care of the right, right hand side of the bow and the deck. And we, the second division I was in, we took care of the left side mm -hmm. and the, the side of the ship, you know, back to. Oh, Hundred feet from the bow. Mm -hmm. What was your duty on the Oklahoma? Well, I stayed in the deck force for, well, I guess, six, seven months. Mm -hmm. And uh, each turret is 14 inch on there. And the crews, they watched. The, they was, it was a little better job to get in a crew with the turret, I thought. And uh, they, because the crew picked out somebody they wanted. Well, they liked me. They picked me when they needed the relief for somebody that went to shore duty or mm -hmm. left the ship or something. So I got on the, the gun crew, 14-inch mm -hmm. gun crew. Um, oh, I was going to ask, when did you go aboard the Oklahoma? See. I believe it was about the first, uh, I'm not quite sure, January, I guess, sometime. Mm -hmm. Of 35? 35. 
And I was on there all the time. Well, I did come off the ship, leave the ship after, let's see, four years. I went to San Diego. I was going down there to work, you know. I had a brother down there. And, oh, I, he had a job for me. I said, find out if I, what I got to have. And he said, you don't need nothing, just come on down. So I come out of the Navy, you know, and went down there. And I signed up there for work. Mm -hmm. Well, when I found out that uh, they was covered up, there wasn't no work, you know, they said, you're, you've got to go to the bottom of the list. I said, well, I'd get, before I got out of service, I'd wrote to a brother and asked him to, uh, what I needed and everything, you know, and he said, you don't need nothing. I found out after I got out, he thought I could go right to work, you know, this guy that had a job for me. He was a contractor, and I wanted to get in that kind of work. And he come in to get me there at the union. I found out I had to go through the union and everything. I was pretty new then. Mm -hmm. And he come in to get me, and they said, well, gosh, we got 30 men ahead of him. Well, that was kind of a disgusting thing. Mm -hmm. I'd been there two months and I'd had four days work. I was down there every morning to the union hall trying to get a job, you know. I didn't even get enough the money to pay my union dues. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very much, it was just barely a little. And, uh, so I just thought, oh my God, God, I had better than Navy. And I've got down here fighting this union. So I just got in my car. I had an old car. I went back up to Long Beach. Captain told me when I left, said, any time you want, if you want to come back to the Navy, you come right back to my ship. I just caught the boat right out to the old ship. What was Signed up again. What was the captain's name? Was that Foy, or was that before him? No, it wasn't. I can't think. I got it from one of these books. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. But uh, I can't think. Of it. Tell me, would you just <coughs> excuse me? Would you describe your quarters on the ship? Well, have you ever been on the ship? I was on the Texas. It's just the same as the Texas factor. You got on the Oklahoma. I think we had. We might at that time had four bunks high, mm -hmm. one right above the other. And they, the division run anywhere from all oh, about 40 men to 60 men. Now, what uh, depended on the number of men was your gun stations that you had to man, you know. Mm -hmm. That kind of, if you needed, uh, well, I was in turret too, and if you needed so many men in that turret, well, they was in the second division. And if it was turret one, they was in the first division. And the number of men, of course, back then when I went in, they were a little short. Mm -hmm. They was running pretty short. They had, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a skeleton crew, I'd call it, but they was short of men. And, but that's, you took care of, we took half of the forward part of the ship down to the water line and took care of that, you know, scrubbing and cleaning it, painting it, all that work. Mm -hmm. Well, the gun crews, they took care of the guns. They sponge them guns out every so often and grease them. How do you sponge you get? How do you sponge out one of those guns? Oh, you just, uh, you got a big wire brush, you get two or three men outside, on the inside, you could have a rope on your sponge, you know. You'd pull it out to the end, manpower usually, sometimes. But we didn't have a winch there on deck for that. We'd punch it, pull it out by hand. And then on the inside, we had a pulley there and start it up. It's, I believe it is electric. Yeah, it is electric. And uh, we'd put the rope around that drum, pull it. But the sponge back, just keep going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And then after we got it pretty well cleaned out, blow them out good, and put oil on them, and 
That's good till mm -hmm. two or three weeks. So far again, you had to go all through that again. Mm -hmm. And the Oklahoma, it was uh, a four bag. We used four bags of powder. They're about a hundred pounds of powder to, to the bag. Mm -hmm. Four of them, that's about four hundred pounds. But of course, that was short range. It was a little smaller, you know, lighter. How much do those projectiles weigh? Those shells. I think on the Oklahoma, about 1,400 pounds. Mm -hmm. And they stood up uh, over, four, over 400 foot tall. Mm -hmm. How do you get those shells from the magazine up to the top? Well, they got a round hoist, and you just start to put them in that tube, and the hydraulic hoist takes them up. Or some of them's electric. Mm -hmm. you know. And how many rounds can you fire a minute out of those guns? Well, you can't fire very fast. The time you get them up, well, if you got to, you start out, usually they give firing. You already got your first shell up, you see. And uh, you can make 20, we used to make 20 second load. And from then on, you can make a, keep going about like that. How many guns in each turret? Well, I was in the turret two, it's an upper turret. Turret one was a three gun turret. Turret two was a two gun turret. And every year you held your short range practice and that was for the purpose of giving the men a chance to qualify as pointers, trainers, gun captain. And uh, what are the different jobs in the turret? He said the pointer gun captain. What well is, what did each man do? Each man do. Well, uh, like your pointers. One of them was a trainer. He could keep your gun, he kept your gun on in train. It's a hydraulic operated deal, you know. And then the elevating pointer, with the trainer, he could keep the gun right on the target all the time. But the pointer, he had to come back to load position, so that threw your gun off the target. And as soon as they'd load, they can make about a 20 second load. And They'd load that gun and then turn on a ready light. And that would signal ready. And when he got uh, one for each gun, if he's, why, the uh, elevating pointer, he'd get right on the target. And as soon as he got on the target, why, he'd close his switch. And of course, the uh, officer in charge, he'd close his switch. There's two switches. So you had a safety feature there. Close your switches. And are your short range, and uh, I know when I went aboard there, why well, they wanted to know. If, well, I, one year I spent on the powder horse. The next year they was going to put me on uh, pointer. I said I don't want on pointer. Uh, I'm pretty good at the gun, though. I could shoot. I knew what to do. But there's something I just didn't want to be a pointer. And so. <laughs> There's two of us that could go on up to be a pointer. I said, I'll take the other job. That was talker in the booth. You know, they had one officer in the booth. And I took the talker's job, but they had to have somebody's pointer, so a few days later they said, you get to go as a pointer. I don't know why they figured I should be the one, but I went and got that. I now, what is the... Now, tell me again what, a, what the pointer does. Well, the trainer stays on and train, just like you used to train this gun around like okay, that. That's moving the gun left and right. Yeah. Okay. Keep it on. He could stay on all the time when he got on the target, mm -hmm. but the pointer, the elevating pointer, he'd have to come back to load position. But as soon as he got his signal to get on target, ready, why well, he'd have to depress the gun. That's short range. If it'd been long range, you'd been about right spot. Right? How's that gun moved? How's it load? Yeah, how, how's it load and moved? You know, train and pointing and all that. Well, it's hydraulic. Hydraulic. Yeah, training and elevation is hydraulic. And we had let's see, uh, electric rammer. You had to put a well. You had a deal there. It stood up about like that. And then when the guns was you went to load it, you pull this. And it was uh, tray-like. Stick it in the gun, 
and then ram your, they'd roll the shell in front of your rammer, and they'd ram that shell in the chamber, and the powder chamber was so, oh, you had to ram it in there about into the rifling, and the powder chamber was all oh, about that long, and then you put four bags of powder. Now some of them used our turret used four bags of powder, and some of them uses five. Well, them about a hundred pound bags. And of course, when you get them done, you got a great big breech, breech mechanism. You close that and put a primer in it. Well, that's about it, I guess. You... How much recoil do those guns have? Oh, about that much. Mm -hmm. They kick way back here. That's the reason. To, as soon as you load them, you got to kind of this uh, load tray, it's up, you got to have it up like that. Well, then when you guns come back to load, two guys, one on each side of that, take a hold of the handle here and here and pull this end down and stick it into the end of the gun, you know. And then they ram their shell in, and they had on our ship, we had to put our powder, four bags of powder, in behind that projectile. And that was about 400 pounds of powder. Hmm. Um, and you could, short range practice, that's when you qualified for trainers and pointers. And if you qualified, you made $5 extra a month. Well, that's a lot of money back then. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I never did want to try it. But uh, between me and another guy, one of us had to take. Uh, talker in the booth, and the other one had to take a pointer. Well, I didn't want pointer. I said, I'll take a talker. Well, this kid that took a pointer, oh, he just upset him so bad that he said, I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, they said, you got to take it. So I took it. Well, I didn't want it, but give me a chance to, if I could qualify. I could make extra money, but I figured there ain't no chance. The guy so said, if you can get uh, four hits out of six, you're doing real good, and five, very good, and said, you don't get six. Well, he said, you might never got to get six to qualify for extra money. Well, I didn't think it much chance of that. I didn't even want to try it, but I, they told me I had to take it. So we drilled there for several days. You know, dummy runs. And mm -hmm. We'd have an officer checking the extra side, and he'd bark it down where you, when you hollered fire, this is just training. Why well, he'd barked on the target that he had where you was at. He was looking through the same sight that was board sided with yours. And we got a pretty good score, and they give us prize money on this, the carton of cigarettes. So they called our outfit. We was getting that pretty regular, that uh, cigarette money. They called us the cigarette pointers. Well, they said, now we'll show you guys. Now this is the rest of the Turks, uh, or Turk crews, you know, pointers. And we, they said, we're going to show you up on this when we actually do the shooting, you know. Well, I figured they would, because most of them was old timers, you know. And here I was. Well, I didn't know how. You know, you don't know how you're going to act. If you get a little excited, you're it's a little trouble, you know. Well, anyway, we went in the Bureau of Fire, and they were, had two sets. They got a chance to qualify. The first set, second set. Well, the first set fired. They didn't do very good. Well, then my set come up. They ship pointers, and we jumped on the stands, and they loaded and went down on the target, fired. It just everything ever went perfect, you know. You could see out there this target about two miles or three, I don't know. And uh, you just follow them big old shells. I got that. I got six hits out of six. <laughs> six out of six. So I qualified and I got that extra pointer money. Well, that helped me when I went up to get a rating, you know, because. Pointer and any little thing it helps you. you know. I'd give me a big break. 
How, how often did you fire those big guns? Well, they fired uh, a short range practice, a long range practice. They fired, fired I'd say, four or five times a year. And then they'd fire, see, short, your short range and short range was done by eyesight. Your long range was done by your instruments. All you needed then was just uh, match pointers on your instruments, you know, and the guns would, you'd fire them there. But the pointer, you actually had to look out and see the target and fire when you was on target. I understand they had a wooden deck around those guns. Well, yeah. You got the, all the top side from, well, from fore or aft, it's wood. And I understand that's taken up in wartime? Well, they claim they did, but I never seen them up. Of course, uh, I never got a chance. Of course, in the Oklahoma, they didn't even no, give it a chance. It was too late. Um, where'd, you, where'd you take your meals on the ship? Where did we eat? Yeah. Well, every division had a designated place where they ate. And I, I don't know, have you been aboard a battleship? Uh, I've been on Texas, but it's been a long time. Well, before. up there, what they call the casemates, you can take out big shutters. Most of the time, they was always out. Mm -hmm. And you'd eat there in them casemates. And if it's bad weather, they'd put that, oh, it was real heavy stuff, metal. They'd mm -hmm. kind of fold it up, but you could put them in them casemates around there and shield it. It was a shield. What deck is those casemates on? Well, it was top side, you know, right top around side. the top side there. And they had these, what, these shutters or windows around? Yeah, that was the shutters that they, and they had a broadside gun in here, and these shutters stood up like this in front of it. But if you was going to do any shooting, you had to take these shutters down. You see. Now, is there anything above those casemates? Yeah, there's a ceiling up there, okay. another, deck. another deck. But it's an open deck on the, it's a, an open deck. Mm -hmm. Um. So you ate there in the, in the casemate? Yeah, that's where I, first, second, uh, it's about three divisions. And then a lot of the uh, others went down a deck. Mm -hmm. After crew, they would ate on the, well, the deck below the main deck. They ate down there. And then the engineer's force, I think they, most of them ate the deck below that. Um, Mr. Jasmine told me that when he was on the Oklahoma and be practicing, the Japanese would spy on him, would watch him, even back then. You ever see that happen? Fired on him? When, oh, they, whenever they were practicing firing, the Japanese would be watching the battleships fire. Well, I don't know. It's a possibility. Yeah. They might have. He said one time the Japanese kept getting in the, in the way and the captain said, next time you're going to be the target. <laughs> I think it's a possibility. I don't yeah. know. We never had no trouble with it. Uh, also, he said there's a canteen on the ship. Yeah, we had a nice can canteen. Where was it located? Well, it was. It was on the next deck below, the deck that. Let's see, first deck, second deck. It was on the aft, about midway. It was aft about a uh, hundred feet or so from the stern. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is on the main, the very top deck? What's the top side of the ship? What What's up there? Well, now, uh, first and second division, we always call that the top deck. Mm -hmm. But there was small decks above that, like the fifth division deck. Well, on that deck, Above the second and first deck was your. Let's see, they had an aircraft gun up there. They had two or three air, an aircraft on each side, five inch an aircraft. And then if you went up on the tripod, why? Sometimes, they, if it'd been wartime, they'd had machine guns up in there. Where was the bell in Oklahoma? The bell? Yeah. 
I know it's up by the bridge. The That's bridge the way up on the, the forward stack. Yeah. After my ass fly. It was the forward mast and uh, it was up there on the forward. How mast. big's that bill? How big? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think it's about that. Because I understand it's still on the bottom of Pearl Harbor, it's that bell. I don't know what it is or not. Because they said when they pulled the ship up, all that stuff just broke off and they pulled it up. It had been down in the water so long, they said the bell's still down there yeah. in the mud somewhere. Um, okay, from the deck down where the anti-aircraft guns are, what's on that deck? Where the anti-aircraft guns Okay, are? the deck below that. You say top deck, they have the anti-aircraft guns, very top. Well, it wasn't the very top. It was, say, the ship you get talking about, the uh, aft, well, your main deck is what they call the main deck, was lower than the the main deck forward. Mm -hmm. It was, they was uh, about a deck higher up forward there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the next deck you had the smaller guns, you know, you had your anti-aircraft, Stuff like that. And how many decks in the Oklahoma? All told, yeah. bottom. Mm -hmm. oh. Engineers were below decks. I think some places they was. It didn't run through all the way through the ship, but they'd be two decks below. And then you had people living two decks above. You might say. Mm -hmm. And how many members in of the crew on the Oklahoma? Of the whole crew? Yeah. Well, it was the, what the, the number of guns and everything you had to shoot was controlled the number of people. But in peacetime, you was about, oh, sometimes you'd get down to where you only had 60% manpower. But I, if it's wartime, on that ship, you needed, oh, 1,400 men, 15, I guess. But I expect most of the time we run about 900. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of barring. Say, we're firing this forward guns up here. We'd go back and borrow a few men from the after mount that wasn't a firing and bring them up there. And the same way, we'd go back here and help them. And it's supposed to have been for a training purpose, but uh, they didn't always have a full crew. And even uh, you had, well, first, second, third, and fourth, they were turret divisions, the big guns, you know. And then the five inch, it was any broadsides guns. Your broadside guns, they didn't elevate. They was, well, they'd be in a casemate, you know, and they couldn't get only. I like this is a casemate in here. Yeah. Uh, and then these casemates had your broadsides out here coming out. But uh, they couldn't elevate too much. So them was them old five inch broadsides. But when you had a gun on the next deck up, they could elevate straight up. And that was your anti aircraft. They could shoot straight up or just about anywhere, you know. Now, what was your normal duty on the ship? Take care of them turrets. Okay, yeah, you always had to. Well, you drilled in there uh, about not every day, and they'd get no, well, they wouldn't get very dirty, but they was as clean as this house. Yeah. And you was always cleaning them, you shining everything, and then well, you had to check your ammunition in the morning, and they kept a. Uh, you had to draw the keys out from the captain, check all the magazines, and uh, check the temperature, log it. Had to be logged every day. Why did you have to check the temperature? Well, they wanted to keep them at a certain degree all the time. And the lower you kept that temperature, or if you kept it all, say, at a normal deal, whether your ammunition lasts a lot longer. Mm -hmm. If that ammunition, it stays hot, it deteriorates some, I guess. And uh, it was always put pretty close to the water line or below, you know. Where was the magazine for those turrets? Well, they was 
Just down about below the water line. Just directly below the turrets? Yeah, they was right below the turrets. Mm -hmm. And you'd have a kind of what they called a handling room down below. That was your start of your hoist. And that hoist would take it up to your guns, you know. You, we had a projectile hoist down there. And then we had these powder hoists all around this main handling room. And as your your turrets turned around, you know, well this these hoists they rode right around with it, mm -hmm. and you'd load your ammunition, your powder and stuff in these hoists, and it was maybe a moving, you know, a little not very fast. Uh, hmm. um, do you have to wear any special shoes when you go in the magazine, the powder magazine, and all that? Well, I never did, but uh, a feller should have. It shouldn't have been a shoe that had nails in it or anything. Mm -hmm. One time I was working in a magazine and another kid working in there too. He went up to the, get him a coke and he come back in there with a cigarette in him. My God, he's, he didn't realize you know. And he seen me, I guess I turned white as a sheep. There he was smoking a cigarette in there. We had to Magazines, we was writing the magazine. Uh, there's enough ammunition to blow us to... I looked at him and when he seen my face turn so white, he said, I knew I was doing something wrong. Said I headed for top size and he realized he was smoking, you know. You're gonna black the Arizona. That's the only time though I spent mm -hmm. about seven years, I guess, was on the old well, That's the first time I ever seen that happen. Somebody come in the magazine yeah. with a cigarette. Was there a brig in the Oklahoma? A brig? Yeah. Yeah. You're darn right. I forgot kind of where's that, but it was. I got to thinking one night. I had the brig watch. Seemed like it was 12 to, I don't know, 12 to 4, I guess. I don't know sure for that. But I went down there, standing this brig watch. You can't lock the brig. You got to keep the, the door unlocked. Why? You, you can push it too. Well, what if something happened right quick and your ship was sinking? You could maybe get the prisoner out of there mm -hmm. quick enough. Well, anyway, that's just one of the rules. You know, they're pretty, they set some pretty good rules. It's safety and everything for even a prisoner. I looked at their guy in the brig, just one guy out there, and he just, <laughs> here I had to be on the alert. I was there guarding him, you know. That made me feel so damn mad. Here I, I ain't, I haven't done anything wrong, but I'm, I got to be punished. I'm being punished, and he's sleeping. <laughs> what but, would a guy have to do to be put in the brig? Oh, oh, hit an officer, or hit a PO or something. Just about like what you'd have to do to get thrown in jail downtown, you know, and do something pretty serious. They're pretty good, but they don't throw many in the brig. Uh, what were some of the big maneuvers that you went on with the alcohol? Well, I made, I'd say, the best trip I ever made. We stationed there on the west coast, San Pedro. We done, went out and done all the firing and everything. And one year there, I forgot what year it was, I made the midshipman cruise. They'd uh, get rid of oh, quite a few people. They'd cut down to minimum so they'd have room for the midshipmen. And we picked up them, went through down through the Panama Canal and up to Washington, Maryland. and. Uh, that was my first year. We picked up the midshipmen. Now, where's the midshipmen? What are they? Yeah. Junior officers. They're, they're men out of the academy. They okay. will be yeah. when, the, after this is midshipmen cruise over, they'll be sent there as officers, different ships. Mm -hmm. So we went to England, up around the English Islands, up around Norway. Sweden. One of the boys was in Sweden. His folks, he had folks over there. He went to see me. And uh, 
We come back to Norfolk. I met a friend of mine from Arizona. We went to New York baseball game from uh, Worcester. Mm -hmm. And that, that was my main, well, we went back through the canal again, back there. But I did, uh, I come signed up for another ship one time. I was stationed on the East Coast. What was your? What did the midshipmen do on the cruise? Well, you, you put them in as they took to different jobs. Like some of them were pointers, and trainers. Some of them they put them in to load the guns, and they're supposed to get a ex, little experience and everything. They didn't get much, you know, but they'd hold a loading drill for them, and and they learned what how to load a gun, a few things like that, you know. It's, Good training. Could you tell me just what your average day was like on the Oklahoma? What'd you do? Just well, average. Starting with kind of where you was at. First thing, we just the deck crew. I was in deck crew quite a while. When Reveille went, boy, you had to get your clothes on and your top side scrub the deck, sweep and scrub the deck. What time is this, Reveille? Oh, let's see. About six o'clock, mm -hmm. and you'd have that ship cleaned up, all the deck and everything. By the time of breakfast, seven o'clock, around seven. And if you was tart crew, well, they didn't bother us. We was below deck, out of sight. So when Reveille went, we didn't even do much. But when they sounded mess call, we got out, <laughs> went up and ate. And uh, as soon as we ate, well, it was about eight o'clock. They pass the word, turn to, you know, and you start your daily routine, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, what time is Tats? What kind of what? What time was Tats, you know, lights out? Oh, uh, you'd work till noon. That'd be just up till dinner time. You know? mm -hmm. And you go back to work at one o'clock and and you'd work till 3.30 or 4 o'clock. What kind of food do you have on the ships? What kind of food? Yeah. Well, I'd say is you'd hear a lot of kicks, you know, about the mess, the cooking. But uh, I'd say 50%, maybe 75% of the men ate as good aboard the ships they ever ate in their life. Mm -hmm. now, that's my opinion. We had good food and we had good cooks. That depended a lot on if you had good cooks, you know. But we had good cooks on there. Um, you know, they bought the best food they could buy, you might say, the best meats. And that. They did, was maybe wasn't cheap. They bought good stuff. I'm going to ask, where was your station at general quarters? Well, that's kind of hard to answer, too. I, I started out when I first went aboard. I was working in the magazines. You'd go throw, they put so many in, and here's, say, this is your ammunition room. Maybe they put two guys in here, or maybe one here and one in the magazine over here. And you'd get a open can of powder, they had two bags of powder in a can, and took four for a shell. So you'd get them the powder out one at a time, and you had a scuttle. It was kind of a, You'd lay that in there, and you'd have to turn a crank, and that'd turn over like that, and your shell, your powder would be over here, the next, and then the guy in the handle room, he'd pick it out, put it in the hoist. But then, when he took, when you had it over here, that was always sealed, you see. So when you put it in this door, like, well, our scuttle, we call them scuttles, and rotate that handle, it'd bring it over like this, and the guy'd take it out, Put another in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the shell deck, it was up above. We did have some shells there on the Oklahoma and the deck down there, but we usually had them up above. They had a mm -hmm. shell deck up there. And uh, get them out and set them up the hoist from the shell deck. Now, they, that was a pretty good problem there. They, 
Oh, it weighs Oklahoma shells weigh, I guess, 1,400 pounds. Some of them bigger ships. And we was 14 inch turrets, 14 inch barrels. Some of them are 16 inch. So their shells would be a quite a bit bigger on some of the ships. West Virginia had 16. Why some 16, why some 14? Well, they first come out. Practically everything was 14 inch, but they found out that they could, they could be, they was able to handle 16 inch shells, and they had the, they had guns made for 16 inch, which was a bigger shell, and more, the bigger the shell, the more ammunition you could put in it, you know. Um, how often would you go to uh, Pearl Harbor? The, the Oklahoma? Oh, I guess I made the Pearl Harbor trip in four or five years there. I made two or three trips. Mm -hmm. We made one about every other year. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you type a battleship? You know, you're coming in, they have these big keys out there in Pearl Harbor. How do you tie a battleship up? Oh, you got an anchor the way, I don't know what it weighs, forward, and you drop that anchor. You heard them say they swing around the buoy. Mm -hmm. That darn anchor, it'll hold them. Well, once in a while now, Frisco, I never did like Frisco. They had a strong current, current through there, and you had to put a crew up there all night long to watch that anchor. If you slipped anchor, what they call slipping anchor, if it drug anchor oh, a few feet, you had to keep a crew on the engine room and everything, and you'd pull up a little all night long. I hated that place. We sat there with them anchors all night long, some of us. Yeah. You know, we have an anchor on display in Oklahoma City, yeah. off the Oklahoma. Yeah, some of them ships in that current will pull them anchors, and uh, you got a certain spot, you're supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And if you slip that anchor, and it's you have to start your engines, pull up a little, and it takes half of the crew to do it. The engineers force, they got to man the engine rooms, you know. Of course, when they're in, we was always in Frisco there, well, they always kept a crew on their mind, not to, that you could get your engine power and pull up, but you had to man the bridge and everything to mm -hmm. get up to the right spot. <laughs> it's quite a problem. How big are the screws on the Oklahoma? Well, you're kind of getting out of my line. <laughs> They're pretty good size. I, I don't know, just been so long since I've seen one. One time when they went and dry docked, they would drain all the water. Mm -hmm. You'd go down and see them, or you'd work. I worked overside many a time, but I don't remember too much about that, how big they were. Well, what would you do when you work overside? Well, you practically scrape uh, all the old paint off. You put on a priming coat, about three or four coats, and then put your regular coat on, you know. Outside coat. Just kind of scaffolding that you're on? Yeah, you scaffolding. Okay. Um. Just keep, uh, like say you had, a, this is your scaffold board, because it would be about 15 foot long. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd work as many men as you could there, scraping them, this and that, you know. As you got down, you'd lower ropes around this end and this end. Yeah. And you'd have a guy up above there too, baby, manning your lines, and he'd lower you maybe two foot and you, till you got all the way to the bottom. Okay. That's the way they clean ship. Um, Get out there early in the morning when you might have freeze in San Francisco, the coldest place you ever saw. That old wind, but it really wasn't a, nothing like what we had back here, but you get so numb, you know. Yeah. I understand the Oklahoma lost an anchor at Seattle. Or was it Seattle or Vancouver? Well, I think we lost an anchor two or three times. I'm how, not sure. How did the ship lose an anchor? Those chains are pretty good size. Well, I guess it's just like uh, you've lost, uh, if you ever carried a watch, your watch, yeah. Bob, wear the link in two. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did you have any idea that we would go to war with Japan or Germany? Well, uh, no, I, 
I didn't give it much thought. Were you aware of the you know situation in Europe, you know Germany and Poland and all that? And oh yeah, it was talk all over the ship, mm -hmm. and it was talk all about the Japanese. I remember, oh, it was a night or two before Pearl Harbor that we was talking, and as everybody had an opinion, you know, some of them thought the Japs would hit any time, some didn't. So December sixth. When did the Oklahoma tie at Pearl Harbor? When did it tie? Yeah. Well, there's a few things there I don't like to say too much about, but we was out all week, and uh, one of the officers he didn't want to go in there. He said he wouldn't take the ship in there. They relieved him, and they brought it in. Now that's. Huh. Was it against one guy's idea, one of the officers? Why didn't you want to take it in? Well, it's kind of a bad spot to be when the, the Japs were. Mm -hmm. We didn't know where the Japs was, but we knew they'd headed south. We got the word when they left Japan, headed south. That was the last word. And of course, I was just the enlisted men, and the officers I know knew more about it than I did. They didn't lose that fleet, I don't think. I'll never believe that. I think I, they knew just toward the. Chapter. I've had several people tell me that they they knew. They knew right about where they was at. There was a guy who was at Hickam Field, and he saw some a big limousine with some Japanese on the north side of the island talking on radios. Hickam yeah. Field was just outside the Navy Yard, mm -hmm. there at Pearl. And we lived right across the fence from Hickam Field. Mm -hmm. Me and my wife lived right there. Um, so you tied up. Did you go on Liberty December 6th? Um, yeah. I was over. I, I don't know. I guess you'd call it Liberty. <laughs> I was home mm -hmm. on the 6th. I stayed over all night. Mm -hmm. So, tell me about the morning of December 7th. What happened? Well, all at once we. Uh, just started hearing all the noises, you know. That I jumped up and run outside there, and here was a Jap plane. He waving at us, you know. Is that low? He'd made his dive and was done. And we was right across the fence from the hangar deck at Hickam. We lived right there. And it blew up just before that big one. Well, anyway, this Jap he'd wave at you, you know. And another come along, wave at you, you know. But they didn't know, they didn't try to, I don't think, try to kill any civilians if they tried any. But they acted just a big smile on their face, waving at you, you know. And they'd already made their run on the ships. And they was coming out of the dive, you know. Did you see a battleship row from where you were? Oh, no, not, you couldn't see it direct. We was, from the gate, I guess we was about a mile, something like that. Mm -hmm. But they was just coming up out of their dive, right over our place where we lived. So what'd you do? Well, as soon as I seen what had happened, I headed back to the ship, and I was down there for the second go around. When you went down, where'd you go? When you got to Battleship Row, what'd you do? There wasn't no ships. <laughs> My ship is already sunk. What was your first reaction when you saw the Oklahoma? What was it? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. I just felt like somebody lost their own mother. You know, you really you didn't know how many people you'd lost. I had a brother there. I was wondering how he made it out. And I hunted all day and half the night for him. Never did find. He was on the ship. He come on the ship I was on on account of me. That made me feel pretty bad. What was his duty in the ship? Well, he was just uh, he'd been a, on the deck force. That was, and he just got in the turret. Oh, he'd been on there. I don't know just how long. He'd been in the turret about, I guess, about a year. And his he worked just down below me. Were you there when the Arizona went up? 
and you described it. Well, it's just all over. Boom. You see nothing but smoke. And now, where were you when this was going on? You know, when you oh. got down there? Were you still on land or? I really don't. I was on the land, yeah. I wasn't on a ship. Okay, were you on Ford's Island? I was right there in the Navy Yard when that happened. Okay, now where's the Navy Yard in, uh, to Battleship Road? Well, uh, you come in the Navy Yard, you had the big barracks right there close to the main gates and then mm -hmm. down a whole mile, about a mile down well, there was where the battleships were. It's just about a mile from the barracks. And there was Oklahoma was let's see. We was outside of Arizona and Nevada. But you know, all you could see was smoke and fire down there. Ships had been hit, and so we seen a lot of them. There, just as they got hit, you see a big smoke explosion. Mm -hmm. We had a range side to when the hangar blew there at Hickam Field, and then I stayed around there oh, a couple of years right there in the Navy. Uh, or let's fly there. Or let's fly. Well, did, did the Japanese attack the Navy Yard while you were there? Was they? Uh, were they attacking the Navy Yard also? Uh, no, they didn't fool us that much. Uh, let's see, I don't believe they hit anything much bigger out there in the Navy Yard. They just wanted them ships. That was what their job was to uh, either torpedo or maybe use some other means, bomb or something. But that, that was the thing they come in to do, was get them ships, mm -hmm. knock them out. And they died I talked them. to one guy, and he said that there was some Japanese Americans shooting Americans that came off the Oklahoma. Have you heard that? I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. no, I don't know. They was shooting, they was Japanese. Yeah, they had a machine gun there by Battleship Row shooting them as they came off. That's what one guy told me. Uh, I, I can't believe that stuff. I'll tell you, I was right down in the, there for a while, and I couldn't even get ammunition. You know where the keys are kept for your ammunition? They're kept, the captain keeps them keys, and then they turn them into the armor of a knight. And the time you can draw a key and open your magazine, Take you four or five minutes. You can't do nothing in a hurry in a deal like Was there that. any kind of alert at Pearl Harbor? Not, not to speak of. They didn't have full, allow full liberty. But you turned in them magazine keys and locked everything up of the night. Did you think Short and Kimmel knew what was going to happen? Well, I don't think they actually knew. I think they knew it could happen pretty quick, but they didn't know when. Uh, it's wondered me, that one officer to me, he acted like he knew uh, quite a bit. He said, I wouldn't take ship in there. Last time, let's see, we was out on Friday. We come in, and this one officer said, I wouldn't take a ship in there, but I ain't got that much to do with it. That'd be your opinion, my opinion. You might say, let's go in here. I don't think we're going to be in any danger or something like that, maybe. Maybe you would. You didn't know. But I think we should have used a little more precaution. Do you think the government knew the attack was coming. Yeah. If they knew, they didn't let us know. But uh, I've wondered about that a long time. 
I think they thought, well, they might hit. Let's just hold off and see what they're going to do. But they didn't know when or anything like that. They might have thought, well, let's just find out. You know, just like if you'd get in trouble with the guy, you'd say, I don't believe, you'd think to yourself, I don't believe he'll swing on me. By God, he might. But you might wait too long. <laughs> and I, I think that's what happened. Was it's your just, brother killed in Oklahoma? Yeah. He was? Never seen him after that day. He went down to shoot. And were you there when they cut the men out of the ship? I was there at Pearl, but I didn't get out there for it. I lived right there, 100 feet of a guy that was working on the ship. He gave me all the latest information, how they was done on their cutting, and all that, you know. And that, guy, that same guy I'm talking of, I think he's down in Panama now. They was from California. But I knew when they was cutting on the ship, it wouldn't be my brother because he wouldn't have been down in there. See, that's some of the guys that they cut out. That was their battle station down in there. And my, my brother's, his battle station was on the turret, in the turret. He'd have been up in there. How long did it take that ship to capsize? It just rolled over pretty slow. There wasn't nothing mm -hmm. real fast about it. It had, it was the water going in was what caused it to roll, you know, and rolled over. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's pretty fast. What did you do the rest of that day, December 7th, after the attack? I hunted all over that navy yard. Thank you, I, brother. I walked that Navy Yard for all that rest of the day and all that night. I thought I might run into it. Where did the men from the Oklahoma go? Well, now there's a, some of them come up to the barracks, got up there, and some of the ships, after they hit the battleships, boy, they got underway, and they picked up a few men out there swimming in the water. And uh, they picked up them. Nobody knew just how many they picked or who they were. And I, I just went back down to the ship, but you couldn't get on the ship. But uh, I run into a lot of guys that were swimming out. They were just, oh, you couldn't tell where these colored people, what, they're black with oil? God, you wouldn't even know them if they your best friends. You wouldn't know them because they're black with oil and stuff. It's real regulation, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, if they see you in on top side, out of the uniform of the day, what they called out of the uniform. Mm -hmm. Oh, they just raised cane, you know. But your regular uniform was your sailor outfit. But uh, now, I wore dungarees most of the time on account I was in the turret. We could wear that. We was allowed to wear them in the turret, but not on top side. You wasn't supposed to, but we did. They got to where they kind of overlooked it. So were the other ships more strict than the Oklahoma? Or? Well, some of them were stricter and some of them wasn't quite as strict, I guess. They just varied according to your captain. The captain made the difference. Did you know the captain, Captain Ford? Who was there that first well, I'd seen him. I didn't really know him. Mm -hmm. uh, you could get a good captain or you could get one as strict as the devil. And a lot of your captains, boy, I remember one time I had a little hole right in my shirt. He stopped me and just chewed me up. I don't remember what made the little hole, but uh, that's the way some of them were. They just chew you out. And it's, they, it, most captains looked everybody over pretty close to see if they had uniform. According to regulations, you know, your shoes, see if your shoes are polished and your clothes are clean. Mm -hmm. But the, for the little things, they was kind of ornery. Now, like if we was going to sponge out them big guns, 
I had to get out on deck. Well, you couldn't use your best blues to get out there to polish them guns and pull them sponges. So we'd have to get permission to wear dungarees. Mm -hmm. But inside the turret, no, we wore dungarees all the time, frankly. And what was your duty uniform on the Oklahoma? What were they? Yeah. Well, after 8 o'clock, I worked in them turrets all the time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, oh. You, oh, I stood regular deck watches. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'd stand, uh, oh, when you was in battle problems, you was on watch about two-thirds of the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'd be up there on uh, general quarters. That was all hands, you see. And then they might pass word secure, General quarters, set condition one. Well, condition one, maybe your job was a four-hour watch on the, on a gun crew, or maybe it was up on the foretop. I had battle look out there for about four, no, about two years. Well, up there, the battle lookouts for the next two to four hours. And maybe <laughs> sometimes you get caught in three in a row. They'd say, set condition, so and so, something else. Or go back to GQ. Well, if it's GQ, that was all hands. But if they set condition one, two, or three, you was in one of them conditions. You might never relieve yourself sometimes. How, how often do you have inspections on the Oklahoma? Captains, what they call captain's inspection. Well, we start out division inspection. You're supposed to go to quarters every morning, about 8 o'clock. And your division officer, he was supposed to check his men, see if they was in uniform and neat. And then the captain's inspection was every Saturday. That was before you went on Liberty, before they had any Liberty. And Liberty was about 50% oh, could be around 50. Mm -hmm. But if a guy wasn't married, a lot of them never went over. So. But you always, money, always they try to get inspection on Saturday morning. And you had a locker just big enough for two suits of clothes. And by golly, you more than get out of maybe, if you was getting ready to go ashore, they might sound gentle cord. And you dressed dress blues, you had to go right on to your gentle cord station. Well, if you happened to, get into a little grease or something there, you'd run your uniform. But you couldn't, you didn't have time to redress. What'd you have in your locker? what did I have? Yeah. Oh. When the ship went down. I had a lot of clothes. I know. Blues, dungarees, pictures. I don't know, I did have a picture around here showed my, I had a big locker when I was in the turret, mm -hmm. and I had a little bit of everything. Were you there when they salvaged the Oklahoma when they raised it? Well, yeah, I was there all the time, but they just raised it. Mm -hmm. That stuff went on for, I don't know how long it was raising that ship. Why did it take so long to raise the Oklahoma? <laughs> they just raised a little bit. Of it just seemed like it was, oh, it was over a year. Why did it take so long? I don't know. They didn't have the equipment, I guess, like they do now. They had to kind of float it over. And it just seemed like it just took them forever. Did what, they take all the bodies off of it after it was raised or what? Is this going in print? I don't want to say much on that. I can tear it off. Them bodies was in there for so long, they, they didn't even find them. When they got that ship up, and uh, I bet you there's grease and oil that deep. And that stuff was shoveled up. And, well, you know, you get a bunch of men in there scrubbing, uh, shoveling up that muck and stuff. They didn't pick around there to see if they could find human skeletons and stuff. 
They claim they buried a lot of them, but uh, I don't know. I never. What'd they do with all that stuff? They scooped it out. Do it away? Well, I guess dump it on the side. If it was just uh, grease, muck, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I, we never got anything back from brother when his stuff. And I never got anything from my. I had my locker. I never even went over to IES if he was at a marker over there, which I knew he never, his body never got over there. Well, it took him so long there. Boy, that's about two years of getting that ship up, I think. And grease, I knew a lot of the guys that worked on it. Oh God, they said shoveling that old grease and muck stuff there. I knew quite a few civilians that worked on there, cut through the bottom of the ship. What'd you do there at the Navy Yard? He said they were there for about two years. What were your duties there? Well, I went over to Ordnance Supply. And I was pretty well up on Ordnance. I knew my parts pretty well. And they had civilians working there, and they didn't know one part from another. They didn't know where's the ordnance part or a part for a machine shop or what. Well, I did. I knew ordnance well enough that I could pretty well most of the parts. So I went to work there in ordnance, and I made a pretty good hand, I guess. I didn't figure I'd be there very long. I had my wife out there. I didn't figure I'd be there very long, but they just held on to me. And the first day after the ship sunk, I was over there at the Marine barracks, and they sent me, had orders for me to go aboard the ship. Well, I went aboard the ship. I said, "What the?" Told the captain, "What the hell is going on here?" There's a ship with a gun that, uh, oh, I guess it's 30 caliber or something like that. Maybe it's 50 caliber machine gun. I said, I'm a turret captain, not a <laughs> machine gunner. I ain't got no business on here. I said, they need me on ships that's got big guns. I'm qualified on the big guns. I said, if you want to take me, I'll just go, but I don't care. I said, Looks awful silly to me, send the turret captain that's qualified on the 14 inch gun, send him out here on a 22 rifle or so. So he said, Well, okay, well, I'll let you go. And you know, I went off that ship and I worked there in Ordnance for over two years. It was a pretty good job. I knew the parts. Oh God, I could, I could pick out five-inch parts. And what had happened? They had them parts so mixed up. All you had was a little number, part number. Well, you, it was stamped right on your metal. Well, I'd take that stamp number. Maybe I'd get about ten of them. I'd go up to the print blueprint room, look up that print number, see what it was, and get the name for it. And then I get the name for it, I put it in the bin, and mark it, you know, what part it was and all that. I worked there in that ordinance for about two years. You ever go back on the ship then during the war? Oh yeah, I went, I come back to the States and I went on uh, 10 cans, two 10 cans. Now what's 10 can? Well, destroyer. Destroyer? Yeah. <laughs> I got on 10 cans, I made two trips to China, I stand burned up. Made them two trips out, out there. Then I I put in for new construction. Well, they sent me new construction. Went through the school there in Washington on that. Went to the Dayton, USS Dayton. And I stayed on there. Well, we made the shakedown. It's a new ship. Made the shakedown cruise on that. And then come back and a oh, short time after that, they had orders for me to go to Washington, D.C. And I 
I went up there, and uh, there's a group of us, about 10, 10 or 12. So we went to school on different stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And then they'd uh, send us, well, we made a trip or two to the West Coast. And we'd instruct on new stuff, you know. Like they'd come out with something new, they'd instruct us on it, and then they'd send us out to instruct. We was, it was, it paid off, I think. Uh, just like one time, we went to school on Anyway, they sent me another guy to Florida. We went down there, and he sent us on a ship. We we got our job done. There's two other chiefs went down there, and they got they had a couple of days to go on their job. They was checking fire control. Me and him, the chief I was with, we was checking gunnery. We got done, checked everything we were supposed to. And we just walking around the dock there, you know, and one guy, I'll never forget that, he was so blue that he had trouble board ship, didn't have no idea what it was. He didn't know what to do, and the captain said he couldn't go to sea, they couldn't go to sea till he got that fixed. And he asked me, he said, do you know anything about this type of gun? We said, no, we didn't have any experience on it that deal. Well, he said, I've got trouble here and I can't find it nowhere. Of course, you know, usually when they sent us to school, they taught us the electrical, everything, you know, mm -hmm. so we can know where all the trouble was. Well, this guy, he said, do you think he does any good? I said, I don't think so. We ain't had nothing on any of them. But I said, we'll come aboard and maybe might something help you. And we went aboard, the old man was on him, and he was afraid he was going to, he was first class. He was afraid he was going to get busted, you know. And we went aboard there, and he said, I want you to come down here and take a look. Turn us down into the magazine, blow decks. He said, I can't even get this hoist to start. One hoist worked good, I can't get the other. Well, that was kind of up my alley on them hoists, because I'd been on ships that had them, powder horse. I said, wait just right here a minute. I went up top of the hoist. You had to go up two decks, you know. Went up there and on the side of that hoist fly. I moved a little switch there, you know. It was right where it should be to operate, but it was connected in backwards, you know. I hollered down this shell tube, you know. Try your hoist now. They tried that hoist and that old projectile come right up, you know, and that kid, I, he was first class. Oh, he was tickled to death. And the old man, he took us right to the captain, told us what happened, told the captain, we found the trouble, everything's ready. Oh, that old man, he said, what do you have? Hag and hag. <laughs> Made you feel good, you know, you done him a, Mm -hmm. Good job, and mm -hmm. he was happy he couldn't understand it. <laughs> and that first glass, oh God, he was tickled. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I thought I was going to get busted. He said, I didn't know, I have no idea. He said, I've hunted. I couldn't find the trouble. But anyway, it was just a little simple thing I found. It was just a lot to it. Would you relate some experiences like that on the Oklahoma that you recall that happened? Things like that, yeah. Oh, uh, once in a while, something like something would come out. But them old Oklahoma stuff was so old that you always had somebody that had been on there long enough that he knew about anything that happened on there. Mm -hmm. What's your most memorable, what's your fondest memory of the Oklahoma? Oh, I don't know. It was a good ship. And it was pretty lenient. You could do just about anything you want to do. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. as long as you've done your work, 
kept your stations clean. You could drop over and see another guy and visit with him. I, I thought it was a good ship. I liked it. Was there ever any connection between the ship and the state of Oklahoma? Was there anything, like correspondence or anything going on between? I don't think it is to speak of. No, I don't think it was. It ever was. see the silver service on the ship? I'm pretty sure I have. What was that used for? I guess the old man used it sometime. Yeah, I call the old man. That's the captain. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. I guess he used it on his parties down there. Mm -hmm. They had, they had people come aboard at night or evening, women. I guess these officers' wives and whatnot, mm -hmm. come on there and they had supper and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd say they used it quite a bit. Was the officers' mess different from the enlisted mess? Did you have a different mess? Oh yeah. Yeah. What was the difference between the enlisted mess and the officer's mess? Well, we had one of our own as a mess cater. Like everybody, more or less, before he, he well, he might be aboard four months, he used to have the mess cook, what we call mess cook. He had to take a rack that held about four, five pans, go to the galley, that's a cookhouse. And get the meal, you know, in these pans. They was clothes pans, you know, one set inside the other. Mm -hmm. And you'd carry that up there, and you had maybe two tables of men. Well, your first class would sit at the head of the table. And you'd set off your five drinks, and they'd take what they wanted, pass it on down. Well, the time they'd get down to the end of that table, They'd be empty, usually. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd go down and get another one. Well, see the head of that mess, sometimes he was the first class, or he'd say, hey, I want a little more of that. Well, here these second table haven't got nothing yet, you know. So we'd have to let maybe him have another shot at it. And maybe by then, why another one a little bit, and you'd get it over to the next table, and then you'd go down and get another tray full of trains, another rack. It was in a rack. Mm -hmm. Carried them one handle, ha handle, had about four trains in there. And you'd get your whole breakfast or dinner, it'd be right in them. And it usually, let's see, it'd be about, you'd have about 12, 15 men to feed. And you had to, about everybody had to mess cook before they ever got a rating, you know. That was for three months, period. Sometimes they'd give you double. And some guys liked it, and they put in for another hitch up. Hmm. And some of them had a pretty good uh, bunch of men, they'd tip them pretty good. So back then, we was only getting, well, it was less than $18 a month. And if you could get a few tips, it's a pretty good thing, too. But you know, okay. everybody had to mess cook mm -hmm. in their career, my dear. Supposed to, at least. It's a pretty hard job, because when you mess cook up there, we was on the upper case, uh, case bakes, they call them case bakes. And you'd go down and get your silverware and stuff, and dishes, while you had a rack that high, and you carried all them in one load up them ladders. And the ladder had a slope about like that, you know. Sometimes, boy, you'd fall and uh, usually once or twice during your cooking and all that or fixing, you'd have one big fall. You'd bust all your dishes. And, but you take that train down there and it holds six round pots to the gallon, get them filled up. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask. Why didn't the West Virginia capsize like the Oklahoma? Why didn't it? Yeah. Well, I guess the water, it didn't hit below decks enough to get water to sink it. The water's what rolled them over. Yeah. Well, the West Virginia settled at the bottom. It, it just settled capsize. straight down like it couldn't roll. Mm -hmm. I've often wondered, you know, they both took the torpedoes. The yeah. Oklahoma capsized, the West Virginia didn't. 
I never have known why. I see. Where is tied to the Maryland? That's Maryland, yeah. It's been there long the West, ago. The West Virginia was next to the Tennessee. <coughs> Outboard. Yeah. I don't know why it didn't roll. Maybe it didn't take the water down in the villages like. Uh, Maybe it was tied solid enough that uh, it couldn't break away at the top. Yeah, they had trouble getting the Tennessee out because it settled against the Tennessee and mashed it up against those keys. Yeah. The Tennessee couldn't move. They had to blow the keys out to get the... That's what one guy told me that was on the Tennessee. Yeah. Um, so... You probably heard most of this stuff a million times, I don't know. It's all different. Whenever you hear, well, let me ask a question. Pearl Harbor is. How would you answer that? Pearl Harbor is. A oh. junkyard, I guess. <laughs> or when you hear Pearl Harbor, what do you think of? Oh, I think of my ship and the stuff like that over there that day. What do you think of the Oklahoma? Good ship. I liked it. I shipped over for it, so I had to like it. Mm -hmm. It was it was a good ship. We didn't there's a lot of things that makes the ship what they are. Uh, it wasn't a flagship. A flagship can you get an admiral on there besides your captain. Your captain runs a ship. But that admiral, he can make it so rough, if he's so strict, you know, that he can make you suffer, you know. He can always, he can always go around, what are you doing up there in them dungarees? Or what are you doing in that, look at that uniform, it ain't up to par. Well, you're supposed to stay neat as a pen, you know, but if he's up there working, sometimes you'd get a little dirty. Mm -hmm. But the, your officer makes your ship pretty well. And a flagship, it's always rougher than one that ain't flagged. But you get a flag on your ship, well, them officers are scared of that admiral. They don't want that admiral to get on them. What'd you do in v on VJ Day? VJ? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What was the reaction? I guess the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, what were they doing, doing an after, right after the attack? Well, I, I don't know. I worked there at the uh, supply depot. We had quite a bit of Chinese, Japanese working around there, but uh, there wasn't much said about the Japs. I never gave them hell. They, <coughs> as far as they, I was concerned, it wasn't the men's fault. We had to do, I was taught in the Navy, you had to do as you were supposed to do. And actually, what the men done was what the admirals and the big shots told them to do. And it wasn't their idea to kill a bunch of Americans, in my opinion. Even I got a brother killed there, but uh, it was told you that give them the word to what they done. And you had to do what your job was. I guess that was a man who come in there and fired them torpedoes and that stuff. That was the job they was told to do. I guess we do the same thing. What did you do after the war? Since I got out? Mm -hmm. Or how long did you stay in the Navy? I stayed 20 years. 20 years. Yeah, I went to work. I come out. I. Was well, I finished up my tour of duty in Washington, D.C. Did you go to Korea? For the Navy? During, during the Korean conflict? Yeah. Were you in, in Korea? No. Uh, when I come out, I was in Washington, D.C. And I come back here. I was working with a Vickers Hydraulics. We went around repairing Vickers equipment board ships and this and that, you know. And so, when I got out, well, I come back here to Joplin, and they had a Vickers plant out here. 
I don't know whether you ever heard of it or not. But Vickers is one of the best hydraulic companies there is in the world. Hmm. They got, uh, well, most all of our, I, don't, I guess not, a heck of a lot of it. The best equipment we got in the Navy is Vickers. Vickers hydraulic drives for all guns, powder hoist, shell hoist. Mm -hmm. And I went to work down there. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd went to school a time or two in Washington, D.C. on Vickers hydraulic equipment. And I come down here, I put in for a job out at Vickers. I got on out there and worked for, let's see, I think I was on my 18th year when I quit out there. Brother come down here, and I had several brothers. That's a kid brother. He said, "Why don't you retire and we'll do a little fishing?" I said, "I'll quit. I'll put in for my retirement." I went up there and put in for my retirement. Got it in four days and retired. Brother died. Never got to go fishing one time. <laughs> oh, things like that you run into. Huh? Mm -hmm. Have you been to Pearl Harbor since? No. I kind of like to go back out there. But, uh, How large the corridors on the Oklahoma? The passageways, the corridors? Oh. <laughs> place where we lived, board ship, our quarters, about half as big as this house here, I guess. Mm -hmm. And you had most of our. Bumps. You started in with one down, all about that low, about three high. Yeah. Some ships got four and five high. Uh -huh. So it covered the space, I guess, well, uh, twenty by thirty. And there was. Yeah. Where are you calling from? About forty. I guess about forty, yeah, forty yeah. some men division. It was usually a little short of what it took to yeah. land the guns. You know. Well, anything else about the Oklahoma you can think of? That I expect I told you about everything. Mm -hmm. I usually, on a ship, they lower one gangway, mm -hmm. and it'll be a leeward side, you know, and uh, your boats will make that gangway, and Liberty Park is. Mm -hmm. Maybe the next day, something comes up, yeah, the weather sure. changes or something. They might put down the starboard. Yeah. But the starboard, they usually, it's for the old man. His gangway is over there, too. So they usually put the enlisted men to go off on the opposite side, you know. So the captain has his own? Yeah, he has his. Oh, he does. Huh. Well, he, when he's going, he's using the main gangway to that. Of course, after he's gone, well, they may let some of the Liberty Party go down and get on a boat that way. But the Oklahoma made that one trip around the world. Was that before you got on? Or that was before I got. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the best trip I ever made on the Oklahoma was over Sweden, over in there, England. That was a midship. Um, and we got into trouble. You remember? Well, you remember? Maybe you ain't as old as I am. Uh, well, these three ships had midshipmen. The other two ships took the midshipmen and left us over there in England. And we went on the Oklahoma to Spain. That's when Franco was having his trouble. We started in the upper part where France and uh, joins. We went all the way around through past the Rock of Gibraltar, up the Mediterranean, and up to the Marseilles, France. I had liberty there in Marseilles. That was after we started over there with the midshipmen, but they put them all on one ship. 
That's when old Franco was having that trouble over there. Did you take any people aboard from Spain when that was going on? Yeah, took a lot of people, women. Women and kids. They wasn't, all the men, I guess, stayed there to fight or something. Mm -hmm. We didn't get any men, just women. Where'd you take the women? Well, first load we got, we took them uh, up to France, the upper part, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we took two loads up there, and then we went down around the Mediterranean and picked some, some up there, and we took them to Marseilles. Mm -hmm. Play them off where they get the parts of. That was a good cruise. It ended up I seen more there than I ever seen all the rest. Do you have any trouble with the with Franco's group, you know, picking up those women or anything? No. No, we never had no mm -hmm. trouble. Picked up babies and women. Mm -hmm. Never picked up any men. They stayed to fight again. Yeah. What about crossing <laughs> the equator? When? Yeah. Did you have a I never got a chance to ever cross the equator. You didn't? Oh, I never did cross. You had to go pretty well south to hit it, and I never did get that far. I went south, down south Panama as far as I ever got. Well, I guess, do you have any photographs of the Oklahoma, or? Oh, let's see. What the heck was it? They may, there's a few in there. Look to. Well, this is USS Oklahoma. Nineteen thirty-six. Well, this is the midshipman cruise. Commodore Murphy. Yeah, Commander Murphy. Was. Commander Murphy. He was he. Well, he was the commander aboard that ship when I went on there. Mm -hmm. Nineteen thirty. I believe he was commander thirty-five. Well, I'm not sure on it. When he left. But he was on there when I went on there. I think he was on there about two years. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a diary from the Oklahoma. As a, I believe that was on our cruise to Europe. Mm -hmm. I put little points that, uh, that was interesting to me, you know, it didn't amount to much, I guess. But, but I, what would be a, Something to me, but it would not have nothing. Mm hmm. Hmm. Captain inspection. Now that was every Saturday. Yep. Now, once in a while they'd call it off on account of weather or something, but not very often. Admiral Fenner. Hmm. Sometimes they'd have Admiral's inspection, boy, then when. You had to be on the ball. Mm hmm. Uh, they always tried to look good for sunbathers, USS Oklahoma. TC cruise. Yeah, that is the one I told you about. Was that the midshipman cruise? Yeah. Hmm. Here's a picture you might like to see. This, well, go ahead and you can look at this too. Oh, okay. Oklahoma was a three mast, three pod mast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say you say three pod mast. Mm -hmm. now what what do you mean by three pod? Well, it's it's got three. It's a tripod, I guess. There's okay. two, and the other. Well, it's like this right here. You stand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why do they go from the uh, cage mast to the uh, the tripod mast? I don't know where the which was 
why they do it, which would be the best. Here's a photograph of all the flags. Why do you why do you have the flags flying on the ship? What's the special occasion? What? Well, that's for all them. They fly them on uh, uh, big shots' birthdays and what. Now that's worse than his birthday. Mm -hmm. That just shows respect to the. Mm -hmm. Do they still use the semaphores on the ships? Do they teach them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you learn them? Oh, yeah. I don't know them anymore. Mm -hmm. you, used to, you mean A, B. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I knew them good. Oh, there's the Oklahoma plane. Plane from the Oklahoma. What were those airplane G's for? Oh, it's spotting lots, you know, like use far and short range, and they get up there and do spotting. That's the main thing they're for, it was spotting, I think. Mm -hmm. We had... Uh, Let's see, we had two planes aboard there, I think. I could put them up when you was firing long range. Maybe mm -hmm. you're shooting 15 miles away, and they'd tell you where you was hitting or something like that. And Do you they, have any duplicates of these photos, or just have one copy? I think most of them, uh, just one copy. Just one copy. Because we'd like to have some, you know, some good photographs of it. There's the Panama there, I think, in the white yes. uniform. Panama. I took a lot of pictures. And, uh, in my time, a lot of people never took a picture. Mm -hmm. San Francisco and Panama. And Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. There's a, a flat iron building. Yeah, yeah, flat iron. Yeah. Now there's a picture of that girl over there. I met her. Yeah, Doreen. Yeah, she was in England. She wanted to come back, wasn't it? To America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that a lot of them like to get out there and get to America. Oh, yeah. There's Jeffy, is that? That's Amber. There in Spain. People we picked up in Spain. Yeah. yeah. Here's three babies right here. Huh. We got. Spanish refugees. Mm -hmm. What do you have? You see, he has some photographs over here. Well, that's mostly just. Oh, stuff like this, ships and, and deals like, well, here's parade with Frisco. Yeah. And, uh, well, it's something never won. Now, here's the vision, POs, different ships, and mm -hmm. different ships. Here's the Rassler, I think it is. Here's the old Admiral himself. You see by his gold, he's... Yeah. Admiral Reeves. He's trying to find somebody to chew out. <laughs> and there's the way you tie up your ships, mm -hmm. your small ships, destroyers. Here's some of the athletes we have. Mm -hmm. And everyone in. Now here's a midshipman cruise. That Texas. was yeah. Texas one with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's New York. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe they were with us that time. Uh, maybe I'm not sure. There's three ships. There's what the canal looks like. Yep. Yeah. They call these little cars pulling these ships through donkeys. Mm -hmm. Call them donkeys. Yeah, there's some photographs of those in here.
mascot of the Oklahoma. That dog? Yeah. 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 Race boat crew, USS Oklahoma. Yep. At anchor. Now there's a way they wash down deck. But these guys here ain't the ones that usually wash them down. Yeah. Them POs, they got What are these little boats used for? What are those? They're just That's, uh, or what? Like I call that the uh, captain's boat. Mm -hmm. It's all enclosed. Huh. And he can go over and pick up his officers. Now that there, see that thing sitting there? Yeah. That's what they call a paravane. And you float it out from the ship, and it cuts uh, mine wires. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah, just more photographs. Hmm. Well, I think we have a good interview. Um, <clears throat> anything else you can think of? Well, no, I guess. You pretty well know. Now here's here's this red showing the trip that we took on that midshipman cruise. Went over there around. Yeah. Okay. Picked up uh, San Norfolk. Pedro, Norfolk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then all around and yeah, Mediterranean. Yeah. Went up around Sweden and up in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then back and went up the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. Left the west coast through the canal. That was a pretty good trip. Yeah. Mm hmm. Do you know them old boys that's over there on them ships in the Mediterranean? Oh, well, God, they might be over there five years. Yeah. May never get a chance to come back to go. It's pretty, they earn their money. A lot of people around say, I don't think it's right them sailors get that kind of money. Thirty dollars a month for no work, and then they pension them off. It they can draw their pension when they're forty years old or twenty years old. No, I see. If you went in, I mean, they used to. Some of them got in when they was fourteen. Mm -hmm. Do twenty, and be thirty-four years old. They can start drawing a pension. Well, they earn it. I've seen the hats that some of the Navy guys have that say Oklahoma on them, the name of the ships. Oh, I, yeah, you can, you can still get them somewhere. I think it. Mm -hmm. Send away and you tell them you want an Oklahoma. Huh. They just. Will you want turret number two? Turret number two. Everything numbered from forward to aft. The way they number, first division would be on your starboard side. Your starboard side is your captain's side. And your port side, it ain't as high class as the starboard. Captain usually leaves from the starboard side. Yeah. You probably heard more about the Navy than I have. No, not really. Most of what I heard, I just learned board ship. Mm hmm. There's the captain's boat again, the little boat. Well, let me think. Any other things about the Oklahoma? Any other stories you can think of? No. You know, everything they do practically on there, it comes over the loudspeaker, you know, mm -hmm. pipe sweepers. They say, fore and aft, start forward, work aft. <laughs> oh, they got, they got their ways of doing things. They're, not, they're pretty good, though. Yeah. You know what they mean. Okay. Thank you.
Well, I, I went in in 34 and 20 on W, 54. I come out in 54, and this 84 would be 30 years, 30 some years. Hmm. Mm -hmm. 30 some years. And I'm not around anybody that talks Navy. That makes a lot of difference, too. Yeah. If you don't, and I expect I break more stuff over my mind today than I ever did, just trying to think of some of the things that might be of interest. Mm -hmm. I still have about 10, 12 people I know where they're at that used to be on the ship with me. Yeah. yeah. No. But I never see them anymore. Yeah. They're, oh, some of them's in Washington State, one's, one's in Washington State or two. If I'd go to California, I might run into a few guys. Yeah, there's several from California. What is this thing? It has 252 on it. What is that a target? Yeah, this is when I qualified for pointer. If you look right here, some you fire six shots. Now here you see that guy standing there. Yep. He's in a hole. And he's in a hole. And he's in a hole. I got six shots out of six. Are you in that photograph? No, I'm not. In, I don't believe that might be me. But I don't think I was in that. But uh, I was the one that put, pulled the trigger on. I got extra money for a year. He qualified as foreign pointer. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of us pointers got $5 extra a month. Yeah. Well, that was back there when you only made 20 some. <laughs> That's right. That was pretty good. Mm -hmm. These are interesting photographs. I was lucky. Well, you got four shots of that. Well, I might have had. It's all the same picture, eh? Yeah. Can we have one of those two? Well, I'll take one of them. Okay, because there's four. Because you have these two. Then you have two more in this one. I think you may have... Now, this kid here, you see him? Yeah. He's sitting in my locker. Now, he lives in Washington, D.C. now. <laughs> you want this in here? Yeah. Yep. Is one of those guys you or what can you tell? I can't tell. I don't okay. know where there's two holes and here's two holes and here's the other two. Yep. Well as long as they're in this pattern there, yeah. they're all hits. Mm -hmm. They're just as good as he's right in the center. Yep. Yeah. And that's your locker. That's my locker right there. I will seek the United. He lives in Washington, DC now. boat again. Yeah, Captain's boat. A lot of things in there. Here, yeah, that's the way we carried it. Yeah, the shoot them off there. And yeah. Off that catapult. That's me sitting on the locker there. Mm -hmm. Have that if you know. Yeah, we'll put these under your name. Kid here, that's Red Cox. He was a third crew. Mm -hmm. That guy, Habiger. Yeah, Kiefer, Riley. Riley. Mm -hmm. Riley left the ship right after I went aboard. He lived. He did. I think he lived in southern part of Missouri. This guy's still living. He was back here to see me. Where does he live? Why well, he lives up around Chicago. Hmm. Uh, Ralph Postway. I think he was six foot two. He just barely got in. They wouldn't hardly take him if they got any toy. Now, you see this dust storm? Yeah. That was right in this part of the country in 1936 when yeah, I come we... back here. Hmm. Yeah, there's the screws, some yeah. screws.
looking at submarine. Oh, that's a... Is that one of the anti aircraft guns or something? Or? That's aboard that sub. It's just uh, mm, that's okay. a gun. There. Oh, that's on the this submarine. This little guy, he went down to Oklahoma. He was in the turret I went in, and he was ship's tailor. He done a lot of tailor work. And Where's he from? I, I believe Boston. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive. But he was a good little fellow. And he went down to the ship. This guy, he was back to see me, that's me. This guy's in Arizona. I hear we got this gun here, a little bolt gun, yeah. rigged up with a thing across there and a pulley and the rope coming through to sponge him guns up. Mm -hmm. That was me when I first went in the turret right there. Huh. And this is my brother in San Diego. That's me there. That's my brother. He was in the sea. The sea bees? Uh, sea bees. That's Washington's birthday with the flag there. Yeah. I lost a lot of my stuff on the ship. Yeah. But I, I still, I happen to have this mm -hmm. off of the ship. Had it over to the house. Which There's the airplane again. Yeah, they're lifting that off. Mm -hmm. They'll lower it over, swing it over on a crane, put it in the water. Mm -hmm. And they got pontoons, see, so it'll go in the water. Hmm. No wheels, pontoons. Well. Now that's going through the canal. I got these little railroad cars that pull yeah. you through, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of such guys down in Panama. I have a picture taken out of the building. There's a stalk of bananas growing. <laughs> and San Diego, that's my brother. There he's mm -hmm. dead. Oh, my brother's dead. I had Kiefer. Now he's. He's up here, Woodstock, Illinois. He was on the Oklahoma. Yeah. I had this guy, he's dead. He's my best friend I had. Did he go down the ship? No, he died since then. Hmm. Victoria, Pompeii, England. Now, this is Santander, Spain. Yeah. Now, we went all around picking up mm -hmm. refugees when old Franco was over there. Yeah. We picked up a lot of women, kids. Yeah, there's that. Yeah, the, that's what the, they call them little mm -hmm. donkeys, pulling them ships through the hmm. canal. One on each side. Washington. Yeah, that's a war. On soldier. Yeah. yeah, I've been up there. Have you? This is my kid brother. I lost a pearl. That was just a few days before that. What's his and first name? That Clifford. Clifford. Mm -hmm. This is my wife. And he went down to Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he worked. For me, come on, sir. He said, I don't want no favors. I, don't. I just do my job like everybody else. You know, everybody liked him because he, he was willing to do anything in the rest of it. Now, this is when we was in England. Yeah. I met these two people. That's this old boy here in the middle. He was a pretty good friend of mine. He, he's dead now. He died. And this is New York, flat iron building. Wrigley's. Spearmint. Yeah. New York again, London, yeah. England. London, England. 
Yeah, see the pic this Piccadilly, Piccadilly Circle. Mm -hmm. right. New York and London again. New York, London. I just happen to have this book over at the house from the Japs here. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's when it was over in Sweden. Yeah. Um, this is in Spain, uh, when we was down as a boat. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's the Rock of Jabbar. Yeah. If I could. There's three. If I get one of the photographs of the refugees, if we could. Yeah. Now there's, here, now there's the King's Yacht. <laughs> the Britannia? Uh, I don't know where that is. The King of England or where? Mm -hmm. King of England or King of Sweden or wherever. Yeah. The King of Spain. Now here's when we went down to Spain, they had that air attack. Mm -hmm. them guys sitting there. Yeah. See, we was pulled away, we went over there on midshipman cruise, and they pulled all their midshipmen off of our ship and put on the other two ships and we went down there to Spain and picked up refugees from Spain. Now here's what you had to do, you had to put in a course ever before ever rate. Yeah. You put in your courses and mm -hmm. they give you a mark on it and so on and so on. What you made. Now this is when I went up for gunners mate. Yeah. Gunner's mate, and this is Gunner's mate. Oh, that's third class and second class. Yeah. Second class. There's the old rock of Gibraltar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I was pretty lucky to come out with two uh, pictures there to the... Yeah. Most ever, most all the guys lost everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, we lived right there side of Hickam Field. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what you first thought when you heard the noise of the attack, the Japanese attacking? No, we did. We couldn't hardly figure out. But as soon as we seen them flying, them old boys, after they dropped their load, they waved at us, you know. Well, I can't think of anything else. Well, I hope you oh, yeah. got some of that. Oh, yeah, this, this will help a lot. Let me shut this off. Thank you. Okay.